It's good to be with you. Obviously, they're taking the offering, so. Uh, real quick, as a reminder, I kind of do this every month, but if you're not here with us, I want to encourage you to join us tomorrow night. It's a Thursday night. Not a lot of people do a lot on Thursday night. We actually meet over at the chapel at 7 o'clock. We do a course on discovering your personal destiny, and there are three components to it. Um, a lot of people think it's this big mystery. The Bible, can you imagine? God sending us on the planet and us to be clueless on what we're supposed to be doing down here, but a lot of people are. And so the Bible makes it extremely easy. There are three components to your personal destiny that Jesus is revealing to you. First one is your identity in Christ. You need to know how God loves you, how he views you, and how his relationship is with you. Second one is God working with us, so God has given us himself. We call it giftedness. Third is uh, God has a vision for your life. And you're to have a certain impact. So imagine, you're going you're gonna to go from being born to standing before the throne of the Lord, and you and he are going to be having a dialogue about your vision and the impact that you had as you lived your life. And please understand, this is not hard. We, we've, uh, done, I've done this for more than 20 years with the different parts of the body of Christ, and people have kind of figured out what they're doing. And so if you'd like to come and learn about that, please join us tomorrow night. Uh, it's free. Uh, we do it over in the chapel at 7 o'clock, so come and join us. And I do want to encourage you, um, please do this because we're, we're moving a different direction. We will be leaving the School of Destiny at a certain point coming up in the short future. So if you're interested in that, you'd like some information, please come and join us. With that, would you turn your attention with me? Let's pray about the Word and the Lord speaking to us this evening. Father, we just want to turn our attention to you. We thank you for Hess, your mercy. We thank you that it's new every day. We expect you tonight to show up in your power and do more than we ask or imagine. Because you are good and your mercy never fails us, we ask that you would form us as we listen to the word this evening. And I just want to honor you, Lord. Thank you for your word. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Please grab your Bibles. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Uh, we're in an interesting place in the Corinthian uh, writings uh, here in the 2 Corinthians. Paul now is beginning to describe uh, himself having uh, been taken up into heaven hearing words that cannot be uttered, and then he describes the process of having that kind of thing happen to him, how God helped him learn not to be prideful. Which, I, this is very important that you and I understand this before I get into the specific scripture this evening. There's something about God working with us in states of immaturity and our response to God's favor. And so God, in his wisdom, has to work certain things in our life so that we'll realize that we're experiencing his goodness. It doesn't mean that we're better than somebody else. But any time that God draws near to a person and does something powerful, there seems to be this thing inside of us where we think, well, I'm actually better than other people. Uh, we need to come to the conclusion that you're unique, but you're not better. And because of that, if you see yourself that way, God has determined to take you through a learning process so that you'll learn how to embrace grace in your life. So, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. Let's read the passage here. Now, just so you understand what's going on, uh, the Lord, uh, because Paul had these incredible revelations... Uh, it kind of went to his head, he got full of pride, and so the Lord allowed the enemy to send a thorn in his flesh. A lot of people think that's a, some kind of an eye problem. It's not indicated in Scripture, so I'm not going to go that direction because it's not indicated that way. He says it's a messenger of Satan. So Satan was allowed to buffet the Apostle Paul because of his pride. And he basically is praying and asking the Lord to take whatever, whatever this harassment from the enemy, and the Lord responds this way, and he says in verse 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I had rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. 
All right, so what we need to do is we need to ask, what is Paul making known to us about who God is? What are you saying to us? It sounds like a simple passage, and if you guys are like I am, anytime you think you know what the Scripture says, the minute you dive into it, learn what the culture is, what the original language says, you kind of realize, wow, there's a depth to this passage that I really need to plummet and figure out. And we find this in this message that the Lord gave Paul when he had too much pride. So it says, my grace is sufficiency. So let's work through it. Grace. How many of you believe it means unmerited favor? And it does, but there's a way you arrive at unmerited favor. By the way, there are several words that are used, translated from the Greek into the English, that's important for us to know. Even though it's a Greek word, you have to look at the context of where it's used and how it's used. So sometimes the word grace means power. Sometimes the word grace means joy. Sometimes the the word grace means uh, uh, an approval or a pleasure resting on you. Now here in this passage, it's going to talk about power, so it does, it's not saying grace is sufficient for you, I've given you power. That's not what the passage is saying. It says, my grace is sufficient for you. Here, it actually means that God is extending himself to Paul, and what he's doing is because of the near, this is how the word grace is being used in this passage, because of the nearness of the Lord Whatever he's facing, he's going to overcome it because God has made his very presence available to him. Now, for you and I, think about this. No matter what trial you're going through in life right now or trials that you've gone through, there's a reality that Paul is pointing to here in this situation. The the wisdom of God is to find God's presence for every situation because that's the idea of discovering grace. As I discover what God makes available of himself in every situation, something changes inside of me that works for the good of who I am and becoming like Christ. So here, the word actually means that God has extended himself to Paul, and in this this place, he's extended himself in warfare to be the solution to the problem, and as we move through this passage right here, we're going to find out that the grace of God is being very specifically targeted to not what's going on from the enemy, but what it's going to produce in the apostle Paul. Now, if, if you guys ever heard this, there are biblically... Ten trials that God allows man to go through in their lifetime. You're going, well, I've gone through more than ten trials. Well, you get combinations of them, but there's really only ten. And the ten are used very specifically by the Lord. Now, can you imagine, uh, God has determined that since you've been saved and he's deposited the Holy Spirit inside of you and he has not taken you to heaven... Your job is not to sit around and figure out how much you're to suffer on this planet so Jesus will be happy. The idea is discovering Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so when you and I go through different types of trials, we learn something, not just that Christ is there, but that we are an overcomer. That's the purpose of trials, is to overcome, not be defeated. That that analogy, if you guys ever heard it about going around the mountain ten times, I'm actually so sick of hearing that. Um, Yeah, I'm not going to say the rest. I'm just sick of hearing that. Why is that? Because God didn't determine you to go around the mountain. God determined you to actually face whatever it is, learn how he helps you overcome it, and then rise above it so that you don't have to cave into it again. Isn't that a good, better way of looking at it? So God wants to actually make himself available to you. So when this word grace is being used here, it actually means the ability of God to release his presence and bless you in a difficult situation so that you have the ability in your soul to rise above what is going on. Oh, one person enjoyed that. Great, let's move on. My grace is sufficient for you. Now, what is he saying here? It actually means to possess... This is the word sufficient here, the Greek word here, means the possessing of an unfailing strength, unfailing strength. So see, as the passage is telling us, it means to be strong, it means to have enough, it means actually the the power and the presence of the Lord that actually helps you overcome every danger, to defeat every defeat, and to ward off the very thing that's harassing you. 
So now God is teaching Paul this buffeting that's going on. Paul's like, why do I have to go through this? As he turns his heart to you, the Lord speaks to him. He says, look, my grace is sufficient for you. And what he's not saying is, he's not saying I fashioned you to suffer. That's how most people read the passage. He's saying, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to show you I'm there. And my purpose of this is to help you overcome. It's, it's the idea that God is going to do a work inside of you of his presence to the point that it wards off everything that has an effect on you so that you're not defeated. That's why the passage makes sense. My grace is sufficient for you. My presence gives you whatever you need to overcome. Let's keep moving on. For the power is perfected in weakness. Power here, uh, it's the word dunamis. Now what's interesting about dunamis is it's, it's a unique word for the word power because it's always tied to miracles. If any of you, I guess I could ask this size of an audience, have any of you ever taken the time to just study biblical miracles just for the fun of it? Isn't that fun? So think about this with me. Miracles are unique because miracles are not something that God does, it's something he is. His nature is miraculous. So when people say, has God stopped doing miracles, the reason why you can say emphatically no and prove it biblically is because the idea of a miracle is that the power of God shows up in some situation, and what happens is whatever the power of God touches, it changes. So, before you were saved, the power of God showed up. He revealed his son to you. As you received it, the power of God was released. Now you became a new creation. You have a problem in your life over here, and um, you ask God to intervene, and God shows up in power. It's the same power he used to raise Christ from the dead, the same power he used to raise people from the grave, the same power he used to heal every person that came to him. It's the same power. God moves miraculous. He doesn't do miracles. He's miraculous by nature. For you and I to be Christians, we've got to get comfortable with the fact that God is determined. Isn't this a fun thought to think? God is determined that a Christian is defined by miracles working in their life. Uh, culturally, are you guys aware of this? The culture is running after this right now. I, I don't know if you find this fascinating, but the... the um, influence culturally, at least in media and literature right now, on supernaturalism is phenomenal to me. Heroes, people that have these abilities to do stuff, all they're describing to you is normal Christianity. But normal Christianity is turned away from God doing this and is kind of doesn't want God doing this. And so what we do is we don't learn how God does it or we push it away or we feel ashamed when God wants to show up and do these kind of things. And what we've done is we've denied our very inheritance of God being in the midst of us as a people. God wants to show up in power. It is his ability to do phenomenal things. You should expect God to do this in your soul. You should expect him to do this in your prayer life. You should be expecting, every day really is waking up and expecting God to do a miracle. And if your heart isn't in that place where you expect him to do that, let me just kind of really cut to the chase here. That is not New Testament Christianity. That's not normal Christianity. The power and the miraculous is normal Christianity. If you believed it wasn't, you were sold something that was not Biblical New Testament Christianity. God has made his miraculous power. And that's why it uses that specific dunamis word to describe it. It says, for power is perfected in weakness. Miraculous intervention and in what God is doing in your life is perfected in weakness. Now, what does that word perfected mean? Now, the word perfected means coming to a completed conclusion or finishing a race. So, and it even goes deeper than that, but that's the beginning of it. It's a qualitative statement, this term, perfected. And what we mean by that is there are some words that are used in the original language that means quality of effect. When God does something, there's a quality to it. And then there's this quantitative effect. It means it multiplies or it has an ever-increasing value. This word is that type of word in the Greek New Testament where it's saying when, 
your, his power is perfected in you, it actually means that there's a work that goes on inside of you that is such a quality, it pushes you higher into Christ, makes you more of something in Christ, and it causes you to actually go, now you guys ready? Most people don't see this, and so they try to get away from this. It actually pushes you into a higher level of a relationship with Jesus, which means more of the love of God that I could not experience before I went through this, I experience now that I'm going through it. More of the peace of God that I did not experience until I went through it, now it's actually available to me. And so we look at it as, I don't want to go through these things. I don't like this process. And God's saying, would you begin to rejoice over this and jump in it as fast as you can because you don't realize what's on the other side while you're going through it. It is not your ability to get you through it. It's Christ's ability to get you through it. And when he gets you through it, you're actually more like him. You're experiencing more of his presence, more of his love, and more of his power because you went through it. Um, Guys, there's a reality about trials. You guys ever look at them like me? How many of you and I sit with other Christians and say, I I can't believe I'm going through another trial? And we lament about it like it's something, it's a burden. I have to carry this burden. Um, I was sitting in a leaders meeting in Minneapolis, I'm sorry, in Rochester, Minnesota with Graham Cook, and he was doing this whole illustration about how fun trials are. And all the leaders in this room are going, we don't look at trials that way. And he says, because you don't look at it biblically. If you look at trials biblically, you can't wait for the next one. This is a paradox, isn't it? Because we spend all our time running away from this thinking there's nothing beneficial that comes out of this. And God is saying, actually, if you'll learn to actually rejoice over these things and turn your heart the way that I want you to in this stuff, you're going to really like them because of what they do for you. So here's a paradox. Trials are a blessing of God if you realize them. They're not a blessing if you try to fight against God, you try to resist him, you get mad at him through the process. You're going through the trial wrong. Don't get mad at God. Turn to God and he will lift you higher into him. He'll make you actually better than you were. Internally, externally, everything that has an effect because God has determined in my life and in your life the blessing. So the power of God perfects us. And then it says this, we're perfected in weakness. Now that's a paradox, isn't it? What is this weakness? It means, really, it it means the ability to not trust your own efficiency or your own ability to do something. Weakness means you've turned from the resource that really can't get you anywhere. And you guys, Here's the fun thing to say to you and I. This is the part of us that we don't like talking about. But you cannot grow in Christ by your own effort. The flesh does not have the ability to do this. So isn't it nice of the Lord to actually allow uh, Satan to buffet the Apostle Paul after he's had this massive revelation of heaven He's full of himself now, and God's going, well, I don't want you to be full of yourself anymore. I actually want you to go to where you're supposed to by having this revelation. I want you to get to the place where you're stopped trusting how great you are, and now I'm going to rise you up to be like my son where you're just grateful for this, and you've been raised to a higher level of walking with me. So this weakness means turning from an inferior ability to resolve something. Now, you and I are are on this really neat journey, aren't we, to discover that in ourself, without Christ, we can't produce any fruit. Do you guys rejoice talking to each other and saying, how much fruit are you able to produce? And we look at each other, well, I was able to do this. Anything you produce in the power of your flesh, it doesn't have the ability to stand because you're in the kingdom now. And the kingdom, there's no, the, the Bible's pretty straightforward. You cannot glory in any of your own ability. Only what you discover in the grace of God can you rejoice in. God has determined it that way. Now, that actually should bring some peace to you. Are you guys like me? I just, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to get peace. And God's saying, why don't you just give that up and just come to me? I'll radiate my peace in you and you'll find it. Well, I just want to know how to be a better this. 
don't try to figure out how to be a better this. Come to Christ, let him radiate how to be a better whatever that is, and then it'll be produced inside of you. The Bible is trying to get to the core of how people look at their walk with God. This example by the Bible is now telling you, here's what the tendency in the heart is, is to always turn to our own ability and act like we don't need God even though he saves us. And he's saying, no, learn the wisdom of this. My presence is available for every situation. Just turn to me and I'll give you my radiating power so that you not only overcome, but that you're satisfied that you went through the trial. Isn't that fun to ask you guys this question? Are you satisfied God has you in a trial right now? Do you sit there and go, I just hope God adds another level to it? We don't think like that. We're trying to figure out how to get out of them as fast as we can. You guys like me? Okay, Jesus, I'll go through a trial if it only lasts a day, and half of it I'm asleep. <laughs> and yet the Lord, now, if you study trials, you find out that how to get through half of them is to learn what God wants you to learn. If you'll learn what he's trying to teach you, it just cuts the time of it in half. It's like the duration of it, the extension of it is because you won't let him do the work he wants to do. And because of that resistance in your heart, you're making the trial last longer. So here's the wisdom of God from this passage. He's saying, now there's a work that God is trying to do inside of you. He's trying to let you go from an inferior, an inferior resource to solve problems to a, 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 a power that is unlimited. It is eternal. You can trust it constantly. And the more you draw from that power, the better you are as a person. Well, why wouldn't I want to turn to that? So what do we learn? Learning to turn towards the power of the Lord is what is being given to us here in this scripture. So let's talk about turning to the power of the Lord in relationship. I'm just going to take a couple of them because there, there's wisdom we have to get from this. First thing is this. The blessing of your life and my life is when we come to the end of ourselves. Now, what happens is we resist this as people. We always want to look good, and we always want to look smooth, and we're always worried about our reputation. But the Bible's pretty straightforward trying to tell you, look, if you want Christ dwelling on you, and I'll, I'll go to that dwelling here after I cover this, but if you want Christ dwelling on you, you you've got to come to a place that you're, the, you're at the end of trusting yourself. So in my life, um, I was raised, my, my parents divorced by the time I was a sophomore in high school. I had no, no ability on how to raise my children. So here I get married, and I have my first child, my daughter, Amanda. She's 31, so this will give you how long ago this was. 31 years ago, the first week we brought her home, as all new fathers do, I woke up in the middle of the night to see if she was even breathing. And as I'm checking on her and recognize she's still alive, couldn't get back to sleep, so I went and I hid myself in my bathroom and got on my knees and literally just for the first time got honest with the Lord about me as a man and me as a father. And when I turned myself to him, now let me describe it. It wasn't the honesty, it's the process. So it almost doesn't matter what I said, but let me take you through the process. When you come to the end of yourself and you turn yourself to the Lord, it's a, it's a process of turning your will over to him. When you turn your will over to him, and then you begin to ask God to step into the situation with his knowledge, his power, and his wisdom, you begin to make your heart more of a receiver, like a funnel of grace instead of a door that blocks it. So when I was on my knees and I'm telling the Lord, I don't have the ability to be a father. I don't have the ability to be a husband. When I put and postured my heart that way before the Lord, I was inviting intervention of God into the situation. And once I did, God showed up with his knowledge, showed up with his wisdom, and showed up with his power to begin the process of not only showing but teaching me who he is as a father 
how he set up relationships, how I was to act as a father, and as he would give me his knowledge, power would be released to me, the grace of God would be released to me to do those things he showed me. All I had to do was just put my will in connection with that power, and then day in and day out, I saw God resolving this. Number two, power for problems. I told you there are different types of trials, um, the good thing is, is the trials are intentionally meant to bring you to the end of yourself. But if you guys are like I am, I'm stubborn in certain areas of my life. So I had this really cool trial. It was way beyond me. It was a trial that um, it's used by our federal government constantly. It's, it's what I would call the main way of making sure you come to the end of yourself. And it's used by our federal government to bring you to the end of yourself constantly. And I think it's used by the hand of the Lord to get you there. It's this really, most people don't know about it, but it's, it has these three letters connected with it. I-R-S. So um, about, I think it was five years into doing Plumline, um, the, the IRS sent me this letter and told me I wasn't conforming to something. So I called him up. If you guys have ever dealt with the IRS, you know it's like talking to a dominion of the Antichrist. But I called him up and I... Because you talk to them, it goes into this bank of nowhere land, and, it, and you have to start over every time you do it. And so I call them up. I tell them what they sent me. We resolve it with that caseworker, and lo and behold, phew, I get an, another arrow from the enemy. It's a letter from the IRS the next month telling me the same problem is in place. So I have to call the, a new person at the IRS. We have to go over all this. They tell me it's resolved. The next month, here comes another letter. That went on for five years straight. And I had, I had a notebook full of every time I called, I had to get the caseworker's number, I had to get their name, and every time I'd call, I'd tell the next person, I'd say, can I please talk to your supervisor? And their answer to me was no. So it never got past this place. After five years, they had started intensifying their letters, where now it went from I wasn't conforming to what they told me to do, to was, we have been telling you for years to resolve this. You have refused to resolve it, so we are going to now start slapping financial penalties upon you. Does this sound like a blessing to you guys? So I have this monthly agitation resting on me, and then they're intensifying it, and this is being used by the kingdom of darkness to oppress me as I'm trying to go and do what the Lord has called me to do. And so I'm crying out to, boy, talk about coming to the end of myself. I, I believe every month I died died to myself. What am I going to do, Lord? I, I talked to everybody I could talk to. No one had an answer. And it wasn't time for me to solve the problem. And so after the fifth year, they had accumulated so much of a debt against me that if they ever collected it, they would have had my house. They would have destroyed the ministry and bankrupt me because of a problem they created. You guys ever have these kind of problems that just rest on you and there's, there's no answer? Aren't they a blessing? Yeah, no, I'm going to leave it there. You guys just figure out you have to find the grace of God. So I'm crying out to the Lord, deliver me, deliver me, deliver me, deliver me. And all I could, I, he wouldn't talk to me about it. I just feel the peace of God. I'm like, well, I know the peace of God means God's with me. So this isn't God judging me, but he's not delivering me. So I'm dry. I had, um, I, I had done some meetings in Iowa and I was driving up to La Crosse, Wisconsin, you guys might have used, some of you might have gone that direction. And there's this town called Fenimore, Wisconsin. I actually had relatives that started that town, so I wanted to drive through a town named after my last name. So I'm, I'm, walking, around, I, I'm walking around Fenimore, Wisconsin. I can't enjoy it because instead of being, hey, my ancestors started this town, I'm just trying to figure out how to get the IRS off my back. So I get back in my car, and now I'm driving along, uh, the Mississippi River, trying to get up to La Crosse, Wisconsin. And so I'm driving along. I'm not, I'm not enjoying the scenery. Three or four eagles flew by. I thought, that's great. I wish I could get rid of the IRS. And so this is all I think about. And I'm praying about, Lord, come on. I mean, seriously, you know what's going on. And I, you guys ready? It was so simple. I finally said, are you going to deliver me? The Lord filled the car, filled my heart, brought me peace, just like he always had. 
But I kept, do you guys get it? I was trying to resolve it in my own strength. Five years of it, man, stubborn. Five years of that. Finally, he spoke to me. He said, Brian, I am going to deliver you of this. This will never come against you again. I'm going to take care of it. And within three weeks, it was completely resolved. Five years of being stubborn. Please don't go, don't take my example to do that. Come to the end of yourself. But the Lord showed me, Brian, you were, you were just, you're trying to solve the problem. You kept turning to me, telling me how much you hated it, but you kept trying to resolve it. Turn it over to me. And then the last one is this. The power of God to heal. Now, it's really interesting. Healing is fascinating if you look at it because healing, the person that needs healing is in a desperate place. So they're ready to receive. It's usually the person praying for the person that's usually causing most of the issue. And what I mean by that is healing is not about how clever you are or how many times you've prayed. It's the process of emptying yourself every time and turning to something greater than yourself to see power come. Every time. And it's a practice. You have to practice turning to the Lord and waiting on him. I was, uh, in, I was just sharing with some people before the meeting. I was in Iowa last weekend. And I've done this for more than 20 years, and every time it happens, I'm just shocked by it. I literally am shocked by the goodness of the Lord. Um, I was trying to model how to pray for uh, sick people, and I had this gentleman, I said, who, who here um, has some kind of condition? This guy raises his hand. I said, would, would you mind coming up? Let me pray for you. So he comes forward. What's your problem? I, I, I have arthritis. And it's so bad that I can hardly walk, and I've had it for about a decade. Now, anytime you hear these conditions, whether it's a runny nose or stage four cancer, there should be something that goes on, at least in my heart, I just realize I can't heal anybody of anything, so I don't have to put this on myself. I said, well, now here's the thing. Lord, bring your power. So all I asked was, Lord, bring your power, and then... We're waiting as God's power is resting on him. Are you guys? Now, this doesn't happen every time, but this is what's so fun about this story. As I'm telling everybody, okay, how can you see the spirit of the Lord resting on this person? And we're kind of looking at him. He's moving his arms and doing this kind of stuff. And I stopped him. I said, what are you doing? He says, well, (laughs) you invited the power of God on me. And he said, this intense heat is all over my body right now. And my joints are loosening up. And I said, well, when we started praying for you, your pain level and the restriction was at a 10. Where do you think you're at now? I, I didn't even get to pray for him yet. I said, where do you think you're at now? He goes, I'm at a five. And I'm like, so while we're just standing here talking, God has already done half the work. And he's like, yeah. And so, you guys ready? This isn't me doing this. I'm still, I'm still talking. Guys, now why does God show up in power? This is a demonstration of God's love. And and now he's doing, you know, how people, when they get healed, he's kicking out his legs and he's doing this kind of stuff. And everybody's looking at him. So I said, well, what are you doing now? And he goes, well, he goes, look at this. And he's kicking out his leg. And I go, yeah, that's interesting. He goes, but I couldn't do that when I got here. My arthritis was so restrictive that I could hardly walk. And I said, well, remember we started at 10, zero, you're completely healed. Where are you at now? I still haven't prayed for him yet. He goes, I'm at a two. I thought, well, I better get in the middle of this or I'm not going to get to take any credit for it whatsoever because God's going to end up healing him. <laughs> now, what is that telling me? It, you, learn, you learn of the Lord. It's the same principle. Isn't it amazing? There really are some universal principles in the kingdom of God, and this is one of them. Whenever you turn from trusting your flesh or turn from trusting your intelligence or turn from trusting your finances or turn from trusting your ability to do ministry and you depend on the Lord, he brings his strength into that situation and what you could not do, he does. That's why it's so good to walk with the Lord. Because he's able. I don't have to put on a show. We don't have to put on shows with it. We can be real. We can be weak. In fact, Paul even says, you guess what? I actually rejoice over my weakness. Now, how many of you come in here that are dealing with a trial and going, isn't this great? I'm absolutely weak and I can't overcome. Let's celebrate. <laughs> you know, there's that paradox Paul's talking about. And if you don't see it in the scripture, then you'll think, Well, how am I supposed to act when I have trials? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll walk around and lie to everybody. 
How are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm full of faith. Full of faith. Now, or I'm, I'm strong in the Lord, or Jesus is good to me. It's that analogy. Have you guys ever heard that analogy that some, some people look at walking with the Lord when they go through trials as like someone standing on a hill and throwing a rock at them? And as the rock's coming, they're going, that rock won't hit me. That rock won't hit me. That rock won't hit me. It hits them. And then they go, that didn't hurt. That didn't hurt. That didn't hurt. It's like a whole world of denial. The Bible never asked you to live in denial as a believer. It said, get extremely honest about stuff, but understand in that weak place what is actually going on. In that weak place, you are in the best place if you turn your heart to the Lord for discovering something about God that will never be shaken in your life again. See, the kingdom of God is unique, isn't it? Because the kingdom of God is an, an unshakable kingdom that is eternal. When I learn the values of that kingdom, when I come into a shakable thing in my life, but I turn to an unshakable kingdom and I take what I've learned from that unshakable kingdom into a shaking, I don't get shaken. What needs to change in that situation changes, but I become, ready, what we're longing for, secure, peaceful, at rest. Because my soul is connected to an eternal one and an eternal kingdom that cannot be shaken. And as long as I fix my eyes on him instead of the situation around me, I will not be, I feel like I'm talking, <laughs> I will not be shaken. I will not. You won't be either. Now think about that. There's that paradox. I'm going through it. I can admit my weakness, and it's important that I do that because there's a promise that comes with it. And let's finish the passage, and then we'll pray. It says, Most gladly, therefore, I'd rather boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ might dwell in me. Now, what does that actually mean? Here, we're back to this word power again. So he's saying, Inside of you, if you want something from a kingdom that cannot be shaken, you come into admitting your weakness. And then it says the power of Christ might dwell on you. The word dwell here is interesting. You know, there are different words for the word dwell. This actually means, you guys ready? Making a tent for an inhabitation of a person. That's what the word dwell in this passage actually means. So his grace is sufficient. And so now if I turn to him in my weakness, he'll make his power available to me. And so now Paul's saying, wait a minute. It's not just in the situation. He's saying, I've learned something that's an eternal principle, and here it is, and this is why I'm giving it to you. If I will learn to stay in a place of weakness, now let's define that, where I stop trusting my knowledge, my ability, and my own background to try to resolve everything in my life, and I constantly turn to Christ. As a principle of a lifestyle, a dwelling will be around my soul with the miraculous power of God being consistently released inside my soul, and that makes me an overcomer. I mean, do you guys want to rejoice a little bit with me as we say? I mean, just isn't that good news? So this is why this thing that Paul went through, well, why did he have to go through it? I'm grateful he did because now he's telling us something that for you and I, this sets us free. It's when I learn this principle that my Christian life just changes and I discover something about the kingdom of God that I cannot ever step into when I don't have this going on. So you guys, let's turn our hearts in prayer. And this is going to sound unusual, but let's thank the Lord for the season we're in right now. Lord, we turn our hearts to you, and we welcome you. Bring your presence into our situations. The places where we struggle, Lord, you are there with us. You're there. You're here. Where the Apostle Paul was trying to teach us, Lord, your ways, let us catch this. Get our, our ability to see beyond the immediate what's going on to the eternal. Let us see the wisdom of what we're walking through. Lord, 
If our family is modeled stubbornness or if our culture is modeled stubbornness and we've embraced that as normal, would you now, by your love, tear that down inside of us so that our soul will become humble to seek you? Not weary, not fighting against you, but seek you. Now, Lord, I rejoice with my brothers and sisters in here tonight for this season we're in. Thank you, Lord, that you are going to teach us your power, your way through this thing. And I know there's no getting stuck in you, so work whatever needs to be going on inside of me to not be in that place. And I commend the blessing of the Lord upon them right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, if you are discouraged, uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, These are the words the Lord gave me. So if you're dealing with discouragement right now, you are discouraged. You have no hope for tomorrow. Stand up. The Lord wants to minister to you. Oh, yeah, go for it. You know, when people give words of knowledge and it applies to somebody, you'll know if you ever go to meetings where I'm not doing the ministry, I stand up for every word of knowledge. Why not? I want it all. So please feel free to do that. So, Lord, come right now. And where this just rests on our emotions, would you come and bring your healing salve to that part of our heart that just holds on to discouragement and and just festers on it, Lord? Would you break us free from that with the love, the peace, and the faith that comes from your very presence? That work you're doing right now where the restoration of your embrace, let it just come and comfort us and strengthen us, Lord. I just bless you, mighty one, because you are good. You're good, Lord. And I thank you. Thanks for breaking this yoke over us right now. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, Also, the Lord, uh, so it's sort of along the line of discouragement. This is kind of how he presented it to me. There are some parents in here that have lost hope for their children. Uh, The Lord wanted specifically to speak to that, and he wanted me to tell you, don't look at their current situation. Look at what God is doing. So if you have lost hope in what God is doing in your children, stand. The Lord wants to restore hope for you for them. Restore hope for your children in your heart. And please just extend your hand and receive from the Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Come right now. First, for the children, release the Father's heart towards these children right now. We know you're full of mercy, so extend your mercy to them, O God. Send people to speak to them about your kingdom. And Holy Spirit, We come into agreement with you. Would you hover over them and reveal the glory of your son? Now for the parents here, Lord, speak. You told me you wanted to speak to them. Speak to them. Restore their hope again that you're involved in their kids' lives, that they have not failed and it is not over. Restore them, Lord. Bring your presence and your father's goodness upon them right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, mighty one. I bless your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, let's move on to the other ones. If you're dealing with high blood pressure, now, I'm going to describe how the Lord gave it to me. There's this thing called arteriosclerosis. makes you have a lot of high cholesterol, but the result is you have high blood pressure. If you're dealing with any of that high cholesterol, high blood pressure, would you stand? The Lord wants to minister to you. Oh, okay. Maybe there's some other meeting. (laughs) All right. Oh, just you? Sorry about that. No, you're just standing, so it isn't you, so no one. All right. What's that? All right, next one was this, pain in the neck. Now, you're not, not me standing up here talking, but actually a pain in the neck. If you have pain in the neck, there was actually three ways he showed it to me. 
if you have been hit in a, by a car and you have whiplash or you have any form of whiplash, he wants to minister to that. He also showed me just general pain down your neck. If you're dealing with that, please stand. The Lord wants to minister to you. And please just extend your hand. Holy Spirit, come bring your healing power and presence on their neck. Just bring your power, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, no weapon formed against you will prosper. I break the power of this weakness. I command the pain to leave. Holy Spirit, grab their neck right now and just pull it back into wholeness. Bring restoration to them, Lord. Touch them with your power, God. Touch them with your power and restore them. In fact, some of you, the neck problem causes you to have periodic headaches. Holy Spirit, resolve that, we ask, in the name of Jesus. We command the blessing of the Lord upon you right now. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, if you're dealing with, let's see if I can describe this correctly, blood clotting problems. Either, either you don't clot correctly or you you. It causes problems because you clot incorrectly. That's, that's the only way I understood the Lord explaining it. So if you have blood clotting problems, please stand. The Lord wants to minister to you. Okay. Sorry you're dealing with that. Anyone else? Blood, cl blood clotting problems. All right, let's pray for this. Holy Spirit, bring your power and your presence. Now, Lord, you're the, you're the one that can actually restore this stuff. So come into the, the clotting part of the body right now and restore it. Restore your power over just the circulatory system right now. And we ask that restoration would come from you. You're the one that brings wholeness to us, Lord. Be our Rapha in this situation. And restore. In the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, weakness in, the, weakness in the teeth. If you have any kind of weakness or brittleness in your, your gums or your teeth, stand, Lord wants to minister it to you. Weakness in your teeth. And so, do you want me to name some of the conditions? That would be soreness of the gums. That would be getting cavities really easily. Things like that, sensitive to hot and cold, that kind of stuff. That's weakness in the teeth. Okay, so if you have any of that... Oh, okay, well, now we have more people. So. so please stand and receive from the Lord. Holy Spirit, bring your healing power and presence into their teeth right now. And I ask you, you do a miracle, Lord. Restore the dentine back into their teeth right now. Restore it. Bring strength to their bones right now in the name of Jesus Christ. No weapon formed against them or prosper. We just command this to lift off right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. A couple more here. Okay, so allergies are common, but the way the Lord showed me this one is they have allergies. It causes a restricting of their breathing, and so it makes them almost choke. So if you have allergies that actually restrict your breathing to where you almost feel like you're choking, Stand, the Lord like to minister to you. So sorry you're dealing with that. Allergies that literally just clot, it, you know, it, it almost feels like you're hyperventilating. The Lord wants to minister to you over this. Okay, please extend your hand. Holy Spirit, release your power and your presence now to your son. Break the power of this weakness over his physical body. I ask that you come back into his sinus area, into his uh, lungs, his bronchial tubes, and I ask for a restoration right now, Lord. Just restore him. Bring your power, God, to make him whole. And anything that's been spoken to him that he will not get over this, we break the power of that right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And we ask that your goodness would rest on him. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, is there a Mary here or someone related to a woman named Mary? 
So you're related to someone named Mary? Okay, and then you raise your hand. You do. Okay. So now I'm going to be a little more specific. Is it there in it, all the women that raise their hand? Is it a Mary Rose? Does that make sense to any of you? A Mary Rose. None of you? Okay, and you don't know a Mary Rose? Okay, so for this Mary, let me pray for him. I'm trying to figure out what this represents, but let's go for it. So, Lord, we thank you for this. We ask that you'd move in Mary's life very specifically. This work that you're actually doing inside of her, this idea that she's very kind to people but feels a sense of weakness in her body, I ask that you'd release your power over her, that you would strengthen her and bless her. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, thank you. All right, let's do the next one. Is there a Samantha here or someone related to a woman named Samantha? Samantha or someone related to a woman named Samantha? All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, a gentleman named, let's see if I got this correct, Dale. Is there a Dale here or someone related to a man named Dale? Okay, who is it? You're... Okay, well, let's pray for him, see what the Lord has for him. Holy Spirit, move towards Dale right now. I said your power and your presence would come near him, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you have, you've created Dale. He seems like he's full of life. Uh, the Lord has actually made him very specifically, has a leadership anointing on him. Uh, this, this adventurous thing he has about him, God's going to put his hand on him. At even a young age, the Lord is going to move upon Dale. And he actually, the things that he does now that seem like they're just expressive and it's hard to like get a hold of, that's because of the gift that's resting on him. God's going to temper that with his blessing. And the favor of God is actually going to rest on him. And he has an ability just to lead a lot of people towards things. And God is going to bless him. And so we thank you for him, Lord. And, and we ask that your blessing would be upon him right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. Did you have Dale also? I'm sorry? Father-in-law. What's his last name? I'm sorry? Leinbach. Okay. Thought I had his last name. I didn't. Let's pray for this Dale also. All right? Holy Spirit, bring your power and your presence around Dale. Let's bring your goodness to him, Lord. I thank you for the work that you're doing in his life. It actually is a work of kindness and compassion that's actually going to come from you and actually touch his life, God. Um, he's in a season right now of just looking for more of your strength, and so I ask that you'd release it to him, God. Um, this, this idea that you're going to make yourself known to him in a very unique way in this season, we just bless that, and we ask that you'd release that over his life right now. Um, we ask for an increase of wisdom over him, an increase of joy, and an increase of the kindness that comes from you, Lord. And we command the blessing of the Lord upon him right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. And you have a Dale. An uncle. What's his last name? Okay. <laughs> I just got this one so wrong. Let's pray for Dale. Okay, so Holy Spirit, I just bless what you're doing in Dale. Thank you, mighty one. Okay, so Lord, I just thank you that you're going to use this gentleman named Dale. You're going to actually come into his life, and the work that you're actually doing is, um, it's like God is in a pursuit of him. He's kind of like, the only picture of the Lord showing me is he's kind of like really strong in his, his own natural self, and God is intentionally bringing him into a place. I'm not trying to make him weak, but to actually nurture him with his love. And so there's this pursuit of the love of God that's moving towards this gentleman named Dale that's actually going to transform him and I think the Lord wants you to just pray into that and expect that because you're going to see a change of the Lord specifically in his life he's going to turn him from just a uh, natural strength to discovering the strength of God's love for him in a unique way so Lord we ask that you'd bless him you would strengthen him and we thank you for your goodness over Dale's life in the name of Jesus Christ amen thank you all right, let me finish by praying a blessing over you guys, and then 
he will be coming. So please receive the blessing of the Lord. Thank you. It's been an honor to be here with you. See you tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. So Holy Spirit, come. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you shalom. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.